Okay, hi everyone and happy Pride Month. I'm Larissa Proctor, Advocacy Curriculum Development Lead and Team Lead for Accessible Community Engagement with CNIB Ontario West. I'm joined today by Kay, Lucy and Richard, three people who are blind or partially sighted and also identify as part of the LGBT community. In celebration of Pride Month, we'll be discussing the lived experience of intersectional identities. Kay, Lucy, and Richard, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourselves to our audience. Great, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kay and my pronouns are she and her. I identify as a transgender woman. I have transitioned later in life, only in recent years, and have had this journey since childhood as I have uh, someone who is partially, I am someone who is partially sighted as well. And um, these two identity factors have been significant in my journey. I hope to explore them a little bit more with you today. Thank you. Lucy, over to you. Awesome. Hi, Kay. Uh, hi, guys. My name is Lucy. Um, I, my pronouns are she, her, they, them. Um, I am partially sighted, low vision, blind, whatever the words you might want to use. Um, I've been that way since about 2017. I've been queer since, since probably, since I knew the difference between being straight, not being straight. I was like, I'm not that one. So I've basically been queer as long as I've known myself, been out for most of that time. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, those are, and that's, that's me. <laughs> I'm excited to talk about stuff, about queer stuff with you guys today. Richard, over to you. Hi, I'm Richard, and my pronouns are he, him, his. I uh, identify as a gay male, and I'm blind. And I'm joining you today from the traditional unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, Twas and Kwatlin First Nations and the other uh, Indigenous nations that use this area for hunting and fishing. I have been, uh, I've actually only been out for 12 years, so, but uh, basically knew that I had, was gay for much longer than that, but only was fully out for the last 12 years. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. And thanks to all of you for joining us today to share your experiences. So Kay, I'm gonna start with you. Um, what would you like people to know about the intersection of sight loss, your LGBT identity and your other identities? Sure, I think the intersection of these identities makes, um, certainly makes each of us unique. And um, that combined with sort of my age and employment and geographic location and other aspects of my identity are very key to determining who I am and, and sort of the heterogeneous nature of our community. I think you'll see the LGBTQ2 community is quite heterogeneous by our experiences here, even on this panel. Um, and I think for me, I grew up in very a very small rural community and my experience of, of being um, a person who is low vision and as well being trans, really came as I entered sort of school. And it wasn't until about age three that, it, or age three, grade three rather, that it really hit home that my vision was different from the other children when I couldn't cope with the schoolwork and um, had to begin wearing glasses and so on. And it wasn't until about age 10 that I began to recognize, though I had no language at the time, that I was someone who was transgender. And though I attempted to come out in my early 20s quite disastrously, and then again later in life, as, as a, in sort of midlife, if you will, um, much more successfully, as you'll see by the person in front of you, having been born as a, as a male and um, now as a woman, um, these identity factors have really created for me, I think, a safe space. I'm, I have the for good fortune to have been um, educated in university. I have a good job. Um, and, you know, the, the journey has been, um, has been one that looks in some ways like a heterosexual person, but my internal state, so externally, it looks like a heterosexual person. I have children. I was once married. Um, However, my internal state is very much was one of hiding and conflict. 
And today I've resolved those conflicts in favor of my true identity. Um, and yet those, those areas of privilege, my, my um, you know, I'm not a racialized person, my employment and so on, continue to follow and support me. Some claim that I'm brave, but I don't feel so. I feel like I stand on the shoulders of giants, LGBTQ2 people who have come before and have fought for the rights of people like myself. Thank you. Thanks, Kay. Lucy, I'll pose the same question to you. What would you like people to know about the intersection of sight loss, your LGBT identity, and your other identities? Uh, they all kind of sit on top of each other and they affect every other one of each, each other because um, I am visibly a minority person. Uh, I'm Black. Um, and uh, because I lost my vision a bit later, so I have kind of, well, not, well, in my early 20s, um, that's a weird time all the time, no matter what, what, um, what age you are or what your queer status is or whatever that might be. It's just, it's just a weird time to be like a late teens and early adulthood. Um, it's just very strange. Um, and I found that just not having the language for a lot of the, my experiences that I was having, especially with my vision loss, like I got um, I started to experience symptoms like at the, maybe in 2013, but only got a diagnosis in 2017, just because of like my inability to express what those, what, what I was feeling and what I was experiencing. Um, and that kind of happened a lot, even with my queerness, where it just not having the words uh, makes a big impact. Um, and just being mindful of not having the, just because you don't have the language doesn't mean those experiences aren't real um and that's something that i've tried to like um express in different circles and stuff just to just because someone isn't able to express themselves exactly how you think that like if, if they're not meeting the criteria that doesn't mean those experiences don't matter um and yeah just to be mindful that um, yeah, that those things kind of sit on top of each other. They kind of compact in, uh, versus them being like separate things, like being a woman, being black, being queer. They're not just like in their own buckets. They're all like a delicious soup and we just gotta have to, <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it is, it is a challenge. Yeah. There's no denying that there's a challenges that come with that, but they are like, I have to exist in it. So it's not <laughs> something that I get to like decide not to wear. So yeah, that's my big thing, just to have that language. I love the soup analogy. I think it really brings it home that the, you know you can't separate out different parts of your identity and say, well, I, I'm not gonna <laughs> include this ingredient today and in who I am. Um, Richard, I'll ask you the same question. Yeah, so for me, it uh, like my, all the parts of my identity, like, like Lucy said, they, they, they do, now I, as I'm, I've gotten older and, and embrace all the parts of my identity. Uh, they they make definitely mix together. But when I was younger, like for me, my primary thing that I identified with was having was being blind and 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 having vision loss. So uh, it was it was uh, easy to deny being gay uh, in the sense when I was much younger. But of course, after several failed relationships, uh, heterosexual relationships, I I started to uh embrace my 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 lgbtqness my queerness a bit more and uh finally decided that it was time to come out uh, at a time when i had met somebody that i thought was uh, going to be a long-term relationship um and so that's uh, now now i i, I, kind of, I my only regret was not doing it earlier but it, it was the best thing i did and then more recently, I've uh, been been uh, becoming more in touch with my Aboriginal heritage as a Métis person, and and so now I can see how they all mix together, and and how each part sort of complements one another, and uh, and it's made me a much, uh, I think, a much happier person, uh, a more complete person, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's it. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been great for me. The journey has been great, and and it's allowed me to uh, to uh, to get married and uh, and and be in a very happy relationship as well too. So I'm uh, I'm very happy with my life now. But it it was a long time to sort of get to that point. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Richard. 
Uh, Lucy, I'm going to start with you this time. Has there ever been a time when you were excluded from the blind community because of your LGBT identity or from LGBT spaces because of your disability? Um, with this one, I like I've, I've been thinking about it and I was like, actually, I don't know if that's I don't think it, there's been any like purposeful um, othering but that's what kind of what happens a lot of the time like when people don't mention things or when there's like a like um I was thinking about the first uh the first CNIB event I went to which was uh before I was even diagnosed with RP or anything I just had a friend who, who was going to this thing like a walk or whatever and it wasn't really mentioned that where the starting point would have been and it was just like near a park that was um, also uh, just kind of known for not being super like there was there were a few um, marches at that park about like uh, specifically ab about abortion rights and other things that that I felt like were were not in line with my personal ideology I wouldn't I wouldn't say that they were necessarily like wrong or anything they were just a bit more conservative than I I tend to lean um and just not having that information was kind of weird <laughs> for me uh also it's just it's just not often mentioned whether or not something is LGBTQ friendly or not and so you often find that a flag for me um it's not something that I really mention unless it comes up. Um, and so that might be, that might just be something that I'm dealing with and I need to find ways to like make, be more open about it. I mean, I got a funky cane, so I feel like that's a step in the right direction. <laughs> but beyond that, it's just like a matter of um, having that like explicit versus just, it's just assuming that people should just know that they are welcome. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's very important to just like make it very clear that uh, everyone's welcome and just like being explicit about who exactly those everyone all might be would be a good place to start. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's been completely exclusionary, but I just, I, there has been times where I haven't gone to certain events just because I'm like, I don't know if this is a safe space for me. And so mm -hmm. that's just kind of been my experience, but that could, yeah, <laughs> that could just very well just be me and my other things happening as well. No, thank you for sharing that. Um, Richard, same question to you. Has there ever been a time when you were excluded from the blind community because of your LGBT identity or vice versa? Uh, so being excluded from the blind, I would say probably not uh, because uh, as, as I mentioned in my previous question I, I didn't I wasn't out uh, at a point in time when I used a lot of went to summer camp or various things like that or as, as a young adult or, or, or a teen so I, for me it wasn't it was even though I may I was definitely questioning my 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 gender identity or sexual orientation at the time I I didn't I didn't act on it and uh, so it I uh, just uh, ignored or put up any homophobic remarks or things like that that may have come out uh, in, in various things and just continue on. So as as now that I'm older, I I I even even now don't I would say no as far as blindness activities go. Um, I I think the idea of specifically saying that these are safe spaces for LGBT people would be would be useful as well. I'd agree with that point and and also that. Uh, um, that implied sort of inclusion should probably not always be the case, especially in uh, in in discussion groups where 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 the topics may be more sensitive in nature. Um, as far as being excluded in the LGBT community, I think a lot of it's been implied exclusion in the sense that uh, I, my experience is the LGBT uh, Q two organizations. Don't, don't really have a good sense and understanding of uh, some disabilities, blindness specifically. And I, and, and I think it's just because it, a lot of the cultural activities are very visual in, visual in nature, and, but they are getting better and, and they are learning, but it's really because of the work of uh, 
of individuals and people with disabilities have been active in the LGBTQ2S community as well too. So um, yeah, so I think that's, yeah. Great, Kay, same question over to you. Sure, I've been a bit like others where I haven't been explicitly excluded or othered, um, but I have chosen or self-selected out of various activities as a result of one identity or the other. Now, I too came out late and never really joined in the LGBTQ2 community a great deal, um, nor, you know, I, I um, was involved with CNIB 20 years ago, but didn't really get involved and didn't see it as a safe space until I saw this um, discussion group for LGBTQ2 people. And I approached Tannis very tentatively, as Tannis will say, uh, <laughs> with a lot of sort of checking that things were safe before I came. And thank you, Tannis, for making it safe. Um, but um, I, I guess I want to say it this way, um, at least in my personal experience, neither be, being blind or visually impaired, nor being LGBTQ2 um, or LGBTQ2 plus or queer will make you necessarily a connection, will make you necessarily friendships. There's a great group of people around this table, but, but those identity factors don't necessarily make me feel included or excluded. It's really the tenor of the group and the way the discussion goes and the engagement, whether we have shared values and so on. And I think that for me goes to, again to the diversity within this community. And I would say too, particularly as I transitioned, I was self, you know, was excluding myself from, from services. And I think um, this is answering another question, but, but boldly stating in, in a mandate like CNIB, not in a mandate, people don't read them, but putting it out there that this is a safe place for LGBTQ2 people will help. Thank you. That's, that's a great point. Um, and I think it sort of leads us into our next question. Richard, I'm gonna start with you this time. Um, what are some of the misconceptions or narratives that people form about you? Um, I think the the big one now is because my uh, for me personally is that uh, uh, my my husband is sighted, and so the I think the big one is for generally not for our close friends, but for general society is that he is looking after me. And that couldn't be further from the truth. We look after each other. We we help each other along. We we both have different strengths and weaknesses, and and we complement one another. So that's the big one: is that that uh, that uh, that people I'm with, and that's a more of a and that and that crosses the lines, uh, like uh, from the LGBTQ community to blindness, and maybe even even uh, uh, people that are just the general society as well too. Uh, yeah, so that's the biggest one, and then the next, I think the other one is the because when I when I when I when I was um, still dating, it's like the, the the you know the the question, how do you know if you're attracted to someone, and like you can't see them, like there's there's, there's a lot of it had to do with with attraction, and so you, then you kind of have to sort of try to dispel that myth that it's not it's not just visual appearance, it's. Uh, the the physical attraction it's uh it's the personality it's the, it's those kind of things so those are the definitely the big ones for me and then the the other issue that happens to every i think every blind person at one point in time is as soon as you're with someone that's sighted uh people in customer service uh, just to start automatically interacting with the person that's with you lucy i'll ask you the same question um what are some of the misconceptions or narratives that people form about you? Oh yeah, that one about people just starting to talk to the person that you're with versus speaking with directly to you, almost like you're up basically like um like you cannot have an opinion if you have a cane or if you are just disabled in any way, you don't get to have an opinion. Um, and also that one about <laughs> like Richard hit basically all the major points right there where he was like um he said i'm talking about like oh yeah how do you know you're attracted to someone it's like um you know <laughs> you kind of know vision is not the only thing i mean i guess as somebody who's kind of dating i don't know well not right now but just because um i'm 
in my house and I go to work and I don't have time but just like I have tried like the online dating thing and it's like yeah it is super visual but there are places for you to you get to know people you can still figure out someone's identity and just like try to figure out if you meet at certain points or if you're like are interested and yeah their physical appearance does play a factor it might not play as major of a factor but yeah like I would still like I mean this is gonna sound really self observed like I would still prefer to be someone who is about my same height even just that like and that's not something that people really consider they're like oh yeah I guess if you're if you're blind then doesn't matter if they're short tall like not anything it's like yeah things still kind of make an impact on just like how you feel or just like um your opinions on things also makes a difference I think um uh one of the biggest misconceptions is that if you're blind you would just go for anything it's like no actually I still have standards I still have things that I like and I don't like and it's just not um definitely uh, a thing that I think is taken into account but that's that's primarily in dating but like even in just like regular life where people just make assumptions about what you what you would like it's like yeah I still like to put makeup I still like to do stuff I still try I still make an effort it's not just about what I can see it's about how also how what what I what I reflect to the world that's more I think important than people tend to think it is um but yeah yeah it's just there are lots of misconceptions, but primarily in, in the realm of like LGBTQ-ness and that and, and and blindness, those are the big ones where it's just like, yeah, they assume that you don't have standards. <laughs> and you do. Everyone has standards. No matter who you are, you have everyone has opinions and preferences as well. So yeah. That's yeah, it. absolutely. Um, Kate, I will ask you the same question. Sure. Um, I love all the points that both of you have made. Um, I would say for for myself that um, a couple of things. I think um, being someone who's demisexual, meaning that I need to know the person and, and um, who they are, and that I'm also someone who's pansexual. Both of these I've learned in later life, and pansexual means that you're attracted to people who identify as an array of genders, not just a uh, woman or man or non-binary, but, but anyone. And I think um, attraction and so on is, is quite complex and certainly made up of much more than the visual. I too have a height rule um, and um, there's I'm an empath. So the energy of the person is incredibly important to me as much as uh, appearance. And um, yes, if I'm with a guy, I like him to be my height or taller. Um, but as to misperceptions, I think there's there's a couple that, that are, there's a duality or, or polar opposites. Um, one is that as a person with a disability, I'm sort of sexless. So I don't engage or think about or care about um, sex or sexual activity, which is which is not quite true. As a transgender woman that I'm, I'm very much um, thinking about and involved in all sorts of sex and that's my, my sort of thing. And that is also not true. And I think the one comes from a misperception of disability. The other comes from a misperception of LGBTQ2 persons whose sexuality is immediately put to the forefront in ways that heterosexual people don't experience. So it brings that sort of condition or situation, if you will, to mind. And so I want to say that that within the range of normal, I'm sort of normal (laughs) in terms of these factors. Thank you. Thanks, Kay. I I think that's a really important point, right? The the way that um, disability impacts the way that people view you, but also the way your LGBT identity impacts that and how those things can be sort of competing right, that are polar opposites. Um, I'm, I'm going to stick with you, Kay, bringing it into our last question here, because you sort of touched on this. So what can CNIB and other, other nonprofit organizations do to create stronger connections with the LGBT disability community? I think events like this are key, and uh, I thank you for this event. Being part of it's really special. Also being proactive about this, for example, 
when meeting a client, using your pronouns is a great way to show that you're inclusive. So remember to use your pronouns. Remember to use inclusive language um, in around um, in around pronouns and honorifics. Avoid honorifics if you can. By that I mean Mr. Ms. Uh, Etc. I think those those things can help drive inclusion. And um, for leaders, hire an inclusive team. It's very important and drives. Um, drives a better business, actually. It's well-researched that inclusive teams that are both diverse and inclusive, the two must come together, uh, outperform those that aren't. So there's a number of ways that you can be more inclusive. And, and again, I think a group such as the discussion group that we've all come from is, is one really important way. And so for the sighted folks, visual cues for others, there are other cues that you can offer that will show that this is an inclusive place to be. Thank you. Lucy, same question to you. What can CNIB and other nonprofits do to create stronger ties with the LGBT disability community? Well, first they could do it. <laughs> they could do, <laughs> the first thing you do is to do it. Like, um, and don't be afraid of making a mistake. Um, I think that's often been a, a thing where it's like, as opposed to making an effort or this, this happened a lot I found like even just like in university and stuff where as opposed to like even addressing the thing um they would just like especially when it came to like even my race like my blackness as opposed to like making it any effort to like I mean you're not asking me whether like you you could ask, you, you, there is a difference between doing the thing and then also just asking stupid questions. And I'm, I'm not saying that there are any stupid questions, but there are questions that you can find that information elsewhere other than the direct person. And realizing that there is work involved in just like participating. And there is effort that people who, are, who have already been marginalized in multiple different, well, in different ways, how it's not just like, oh yeah, we'll just do this thing and then hope for the best. But yeah, do the thing first and then we'll see how it goes from there. Uh, I think a lot of the time it's like, it's a lot easier to just be like, oh yeah, how can we make this more inclusive? It's like, yeah, just do it and try it. And then if you mess up, it's not it's not the end of the world to have a bit of con conflict is not necessarily abuse. Like if you are in a situation where there is a bit of conflict and if there is th there are different opinions on things, that's okay. That's not... A bad thing that's probably better for growth I don't know if that's true or not I'm just saying it because it, it, it feels right to me <laughs> it's like I have no scientific evidence <laughs> I'm just saying words but yeah I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to have a bit of conflict or have a, a differing of opinion on certain things just giving people especially yeah diverse people the opportunity to have those conversations and to and be open and willing to like hear other voices um yeah as, as Kay was saying it was just 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 important to have that conversation to begin with if you're not doing it then it's not being done and even if you're doing it wrongly it can it can get better I do understand that there is a bit of hesitation a lot of the time just because it's but no one's getting cancelled everyone's will we'll, we'll all be okay in the end I think <laughs> We'll all be fine at the end. And just like being okay to make that first step is I think a good place to start. I love that. Creating the space for, for diversity and inclusion and, and be willing to make mistakes. Just, yeah, just do it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> just do it. Uh, Richard, over to you. What are your thoughts? Um, well, Kate, Kate, Kate and Lucy took most of my points, but I, I like, I, I think, <laughs> I, like I would agree, like creating that, that creating that space for, uh, and that diversity and inclusion uh, frame, uh, sort of um, sort of culture in the organization and uh, and actually uh, embracing diversity and, uh, and 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 getting people from diverse backgrounds more involved in key decision making and 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 and, and, and having uh, encouraging uh, clients and uh, other other stakeholders to have those diversity and inclusion discussions as well too um, reaching out to community organizations that are, it, since we're dealing specifically with lgbtq2s uh, reaching out to those organizations and and uh, and offering 
uh, your knowledge about blindness or other uh, other disability related issues and then helping them sort of have those discussions about uh, those diversity discussions within their own community within the communities about uh, in this case specifically blindness or other disabilities as well too and and just working with other blindness organizations to be be more cognizant of the, uh, the of the their their own potentially diverse sort of uh, members or, or uh, constituents as well too. So I think that's a big part of it. And, and like, I think it'll, it would help, it, it would help even progress um, the knowledge within the LGBTQ community about disability and helping them have accessible resources as well too for the people that approach those organizations first of, before going to uh, organizations like CNIB as well. Fantastic point. Um, so that brings us to the end of our questions. Um, is there anything, any final thoughts that anybody would like to, to share for our audience? I would like to share just um, picking up on what Lucy said. Um, you know, it's important uh, for folks to educate themselves rather than relying on members of equity deserving groups to do that. So I think um, congratulations to those of you that have listened in on this conversation. It's an ongoing conversation as are conversations about other identity factors. And depending on your own identity factors, because, because we can't assume that our audience does not also have a variety of identity factors that they come to the table with, um, it's important just to, to educate yourself in the basics and then you can better hear the stories of those of us who, who are from equity deserving groups and um, maybe reflect upon your own identity factors and what you bring to, to discussions and interactions with others. Thanks, that's my final thought. Appreciate it, fantastic. Lucy, Richard? Um. Yeah, I, I think that this is definitely like uh, for some people, this might be the beginning. And then thank you for again, thank you for taking the time to listen to this. And for some of you, this might be partly through your journey of, of understanding uh, uh, discussions about equity and diversity. And even for, for us on the panel, I think it's if it's a learn it's a learning opportunity for us as we as we uh hear more about how, how other people identify themselves and how those how, the, how those identities mix together in the in the soup so to speak and uh so i think that that it's great it, it, because we, we never finish learning so thank you for participating in this discussion lucy over to you final thoughts oh yeah yeah i uh, good job guys you did a thing <laughs> You listen to me ramble on for a bit and you also listen to people who are probably better at saying the words than I am. And so good job for doing that, but don't make this be the end of what you're doing. Um, and don't make that like, because I guess it's it's the end of the month now when you're listening or watching or doing whatever with this bit. Um, and it is, it's kind of, it's always fun. It's always it, interesting how a lot of the time we have these conversations at a specific moment um I can think of many times where we've had conversations about a thing in a moment um and then it doesn't really translate to anything um and just being mindful that these things like yeah like we don't stop existing because the month of June is done um and we still we, we're still we're still here uh we're, we still matter and it's still important for you to just keep on having those conversations even amongst people that you would assume are like not part of the community I think those are the most important conversations because we can't do that those conversations because we're not usually invited into those spaces so now you have to advocate for us because we're not there often well often often we're not invited into those spaces so like there is a bit of privilege that comes with being involved in those spaces and taking action in a real way even if it's just like a small way even if it's just like mentioning a thing or like saying or or advocating for someone or just asking the right questions all of those things are important and they do impact how we how we can get along together yeah so it's I think it's really good and it, it ch does change the experience of everyone so yeah that's my final 
word salad <laughs> <laughs> soup and salad <laughs> fantastic maybe i'm just hungry <laughs> that could be that could be um thank you thank you all so much um that brings us to the end of our discussion but i'd like to offer a sincere thank you to each of you for taking the time to share your experiences with me i think this is a conversation that we'd all be happy to keep digging into but i'm sure that our audience has some questions once again, thank you for joining us and happy Pride Month.